Good morning, distinguished guests. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm very pleased to be here today to discuss the future of labor, a subject about which we are all concerned. We all recognize the importance of the issue and recognize that while changes in this area are inevitable, even desirable, they at times can be difficult and come at a cost. One of President Lula's first initiatives upon assuming the presidency was to create the National Labor Forum based on the tripartite model of the International Labor Organization. The forum includes representatives from employers, workers, and the government. President Lula charged this body with developing proposals for the thorough reform of the structure of unions in this country, as well as the reform of legislation related to workers, the workplace, and labor practices. President Lula clearly recognized and thought the time was right for a fresh look at labor in Brazil. While nearly everyone I meet in Brazil agrees that some changes in this area are needed, almost nobody, nobody agrees on exactly what those changes should be or the timing of their implementation. But for today, that debate should be left for the Brazilians to answer. My topic is labor in a more global sense because it is clear that globalization has had a profound impact on labor in every area. Management, workers, jobs, labor relations, conditions of work, and part of work that you can't even care to name. Thomas Friedman, foreign affairs columnist for the New York Times, an author of the book, The Lexus and the Olive Tree, has just published a new study on globalization called The World is Flat. Friedman's main point is that the rise of information technology means that globalization of work and the subsequent outsourcing of jobs have only just begun. One of Friedman's conclusions is that our sons and daughters will be competing for jobs not just with their schoolmates in their own communities, states and nations, but ultimately with graduates from schools from all over the world. The central point of Friedman's argument seems to me beyond dispute. In a globalized world, education will be even more important. Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice made exactly that same point several days ago when she spoke at the Juscelino Kubitschek Memorial in Brasilia. The secretary noted that education gives people the power to rise as high as their natural talents will take them. It is an absolute prerequisite to be able to compete in a globalized world. As the Secretary continued, social mobility fueled by merit and encumbered by nothing must be the great goal of every democracy. Those on the margins of society must know that even in their lives are not what they had hoped for. Their children will have a bright future and limitless horizons. Education will enable every Latin American democracy including Brazil, to reduce the inequality between those who are currently benefiting from democracy and those who are not benefiting, benefiting from democracy. I am pleased to note that President Lula has made education a priority. President Bush similarly has acted to expand educational opportunities throughout the hemisphere. The President announced the creation of the Centers of Excellence in Teacher Training at the Summit of the Americas a program that has trained nearly 7,000 instructors to train teachers in the region. Education clearly will be important in creating social mobility, equality, and job opportunities in the future. And I might note at this point that those are, th are three concerns of every labor movement in the world. Another aspect of the globalized world that will clearly be a part of the future of labor is trade. We in the United States are convinced that trade liberalization is unequivocally a good thing and conducive to prosperity. And we, and we are now in the midst of negotiating the free trade agreement of the Americas. In Brasilia, Secretary Rice was unambiguous when she stated that the 34 democracies of the Western Hemisphere must press forward on ALCA. We have an opportunity to unite 800 million people from southern Chile to northern Canada into the world's largest free trading community. 
This would produce an unstoppable force for prosperity that will lift the hopes of all of our citizens. Some in the organized labor movement would argue that trade inevitably results in the loss of jobs. But I would answer that while some jobs inevitably are lost as a result of new openings for trade, many more jobs are created. Federal Reserve Governor Ben Bernanke stated, studied, in the United States, studied the United States economy and found that in 1960, imports to the U.S. represented roughly 4% of GDP. By 2004, that figure was 14%. This period also saw the entry of the post-World War II baby boom generation, the largest cohort in American history, to the labor market, and the new entry of many women who had previously not worked outside of the home. Despite this, the American economy created 60 million new jobs, and the unemployment rate that stood at 5.5 in 1960, in 2004, stands at 5.6%. Virtually no change. Despite an explosion of imports that will produce a trade deficit of roughly $500 billion in 2005, unemployment did not rise. American workers benefited from this process. U.S. exports accounted for about 25% of U.S. growth in the 1990s and supported an estimated 12 million jobs. One in every five factory jobs is due to manufacturing exports, and jobs in exporting plants pay wages that average 18% higher than jobs in non-exporting plants. Trade also helps consumers. Trade agreements concluded in the past decade have raised the standard of living of the average American family of four by about $2,000 a year. Even the outsourcing of jobs has been beneficial in some instances. A McKinsey Global Institute study showed that outsourcing abroad has reduced the prices of information technology hardware to upwards of 30%. This has stimulated the diffusion of the technology throughout the United States economy and raised both productivity and growth by a very, very significant 0.3% a year. In an economy of more than $7 trillion, this means billions and billions of dollars. While trade produces clear benefits for the economy and society as a whole, in both the short and long run, in the short run, there inevitably are businesses, industries, and workers who are losers. Here is a point where we must direct our attention. Clearly, with the expansion of trade and the globalization of labor, retraining and reducing and re-educating workers will become ever more important. With this in mind, President Bush has greatly expanded trade adjustment assistance, funds available to workers who have been displaced by trade or the movement of production abroad. Workers receive benefits from unemployment and health insurance and funding for retraining for up to two and a half years after a worker has been displaced. Federal Reserve Board Governor Bernanke also pointed out that three excellent reasons for continuing and expanding this type of assistance. One, helping displaced workers is the right and fair thing to do. Two, helping displaced workers find new jobs benefits the economy, as well as the workers and their families. And three, effective programs will make workers less fearful of change and less pressure will be exerted to erect trade barriers that would reduce the flexib flexibility and efficiency of the U.S. economy. These programs are not perfect. As global trade increases, we will have to give more attention and resources to helping workers adjust to displacement. One way of helping displaced workers involves the final area that I would like to discuss, reducing the rigidity and regulation of labor markets. In a globalized world, the outcome seems relatively easy to predict. An important aspect of economic growth is the creation of jobs. In a democratic society, politically, this may often be the most important aspect of growth. The unfortunate truth seems to be that reducing regulations of the labor market, making both hiring and firing easier, stimulates job creation. The United States is a very good example of this. In terms of labor force reduction, the United States is one of the easiest places in the world to do this. The U.S. has very few legal impediments to laying off workers during an economic slowdown. 
One economist estimated that the U.S. loses 15 million jobs a year. Obviously, this is an amazing number. It represents approximately 14% of private non-farm employment. At the same time, however, the U.S. private sector has created a net 1.8 million jobs for each of the last 10 years. This means that the U.S. economy, losing roughly 15 million jobs a year, creates at the same time nearly 17 million jobs a year. As one economist observed, truly, the U.S. labor market exhibits a phenomenal capacity for creative destruction. Like it or not, I'm afraid that this represents the wave of the future. Growth and job creation will come in those societies where it is easiest to both create and reduce jobs. Rigid labor markets have become synonymous with high unemployment throughout the world. A University of Chicago study showed a direct correlation between labor market rigidity and job creation. The more legal protection an employed worker had from firing, the slower the rate of job creation. As the study's author put it, societies offer strong legal protections for those workers who have jobs at the expense of those who do not have jobs. As with trade, the society may well be better served by offering training to newly unemployed workers in place of regulations that force or encourage employers to keep redundant workers. This year, President Bush has authorized $23 billion in various training programs related to job creation in the, in the workplace. Finding better ways to help workers retool and re-educate themselves is the wave of the future. In conclusion, as we move with optimism and realism into the 21st century, the reality that emerges is this. The future of labor lies inevitably in globalization. And because of this, education, trade, and flexibility will be all important in the generation of, of growth in jobs, social, mo social mobility, and equality for the workers of tomorrow. Thank you very much.